In Matthew chapter 21, our Lord and Savior is being asked about some things that had been done before in previous points in this chapter. And it says, Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John. Where was it from? From heaven or from men? When you look at this passage of Scripture, that point that is made very clearly, by what authority are you doing these things? And a question that would go with that, who gave you this authority? That's a strange question to a lot of people in the religious world today because they don't even think about the idea of authority. But at least these chief priests and elders were ones who gave some lip service to the idea of thinking that you need to have authority for what you do. Jesus is one who responded to them and asked them a question that made it clear he was thinking in the same line. He says, the baptism of John. I want you to answer me first, where was it from? Was it from heaven or from men? The idea of by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you that authority, Jesus honed in and he centered in on something there. The point was that he gave them two options. And these are the only two options with regard to religious action. What is it? Is it from heaven or if it, is it from men? If it's from heaven, that means it's of divine origin. God is the one who authorized that. He is the one who began that practice and therefore it is right for us to do. But if man is the source of that, if it is of human authority, then one who is of human authority cannot instruct us about that which is to be done in religious matters. God has that authority. And so he asked with regard to the baptism of John, is it just something that came from man? In other words, you don't have to be ones who would go along with that and do that. Or did it come from God, which would necessitate you having done this? We know that was a problem for them because in Luke chapter 7 it points out they refused that. They would not be baptized with the baptism of John. And so if they said it's from heaven, then Jesus said, they'll ask, well, why did you not do these things? But if we say from men, they were afraid of the crowd because the crowd recognized that John was a prophet. And so they took the cowardly way out. We just don't know. When you look at the idea of where does authority come from, where does a practice for anything come from, it has to come from one of those two things in religious matters. And if it is from heaven, then we must be obedient to that. If it is from man, we cannot add that to the practice that comes as directed by Almighty God. Let's look at this context and introduce it a little bit because it's necessary for us to know a few things about this. The text says that the chief priests and elders of the people confronted Jesus. That's who it is that is asking this particular question. We might say, well, then who are they? How did they come to that place of power? That would be a logical answer or a question to ask with regard to that. And the answer is something that we're going to have to contrast with what God said. Look in Leviticus chapter 22 and in verse 9. Here an instruction given to those who were priests, this whole book being directed to them, in Leviticus chapter 22 and in verse 9 it says, They, speaking of the priests, they shall therefore keep my ordinances, lest they bear sin for it, and die thereby. If they profane it, I, the Lord, sanctify them. The idea is that they're going to have to listen not to what they want to do, they're going to have to listen to what I do. And if they go against that, then God says, I'm going to sanctify, I'm going to set it apart. If they did something other, that did not make it the will of God. They had to come back to that which was the original will of God. In Leviticus chapter 10, and in verses 1 through 3, there's a point of 
what was necessary or mandatory for those who were the priests of God to do. In Leviticus chapter 10, look with me in verse 1, where we notice what happened when people went away from that truth. It says, Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane, or the King James says strange, fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. There were the sons of Aaron, and they did that which God told them not to do. The fire that was to be taken was the fire that was off of the altar. <coughs> Wherever the source of this fire was that they took, it was strange, profane. It was not that which God gave and sanctified for that purpose. But they decided on another practice. Well, did God allow that? Was that substitute fine with him? Obviously not. Because the point is, there was a fire that was that which consumed them. Look in verse 3, when it says, as Moses was talking to Aaron, he says, this is what the Lord spoke. So when this practice was done, and here these men were ones who were killed because of that practice, Moses now is explaining why is this done. He says to Aaron, you remember what the Lord said. And then he goes right back to the statements that were made by the Lord in the law that by those who come near me, speaking of the priests, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people... I must be glorified. Who was it that Nadab and Abihu were glorifying by their addition of a practice that God did not ordain? They were glorifying themselves. They were thinking that what they desired to do, what they wanted to do, what they thought would be best, they substituted that for the will of God, the statement that God had given them. And the point is made, they needed to see God as holy. He's set apart, and therefore when he says something, it incurs that holiness that is of God's nature. The reason we call it a holy Bible is not because somehow we want to worship the ink and the paper that's there or the leather that it's bound with. That's not the point. It's holy because its holiness comes from God. And when God says something, that is supposed to be seen as sanctified, set apart, holy. It's after His nature. And we can't change it because we're mere men. And He is the one who is the Almighty, the old holy and we must listen to Him. All that He says is what we must do. That's the point that He made with these Levites. When you look a little bit further in the Old Testament, over to the very end of the book, in Malachi chapter 2, Malachi chapter 2, I want you to start with me in verse 1. By this time, you had had Israel and Judah that had separated. They had both gone into captivity. There was the bringing back of that remnant as God had promised in captivity. They did not give themselves again to idolatry, but that doesn't mean that they were ones that lived right in the sight of God. They had substituted in different ways their own will for the will of God. In chapter 2 of Malachi, it says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. You notice that? He's speaking to the priests again here. This commandment is for you. If you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants, and spread refuse on your face, and refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take, uh, take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. 
The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and the people should seek the law from his mouth, for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way, you have caused many to stumble at the law, and have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you have not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in the law. That was the responsibility that was basically a summary of what God had said back in the Pentateuch regarding the law as it was given and the purpose of the priests with regard to that. Their main purpose was one even before the offering of sacrifices. Their main purpose was to teach that law. And the responsibility was given to them to make the people know that law. As long as they were doing that, God said, there was a covenant of peace with them. There was something where God accepted them and gave them privileges. But when they went against that, what did God do? God counted them as those who were not acceptable. Indeed, in verse 9, it points out, I have made you contemptible and base. I have seen you as those who are in refuse. I'm ready to throw you away, basically, because you've done those things that are not right in the sight of God. When you look at the Old Testament, that's basically what was happening with those who were there of the priests in Old Testament times. When you come to the Maccabean times, that's the time in between, the close of the Old Testament, Malachi being the last book there, telling us that all through that time, they mostly had done evil. Now in the Maccabean time, comes along the idea of those who would change the high priesthood. You remember in Maccabean times, Judas the Maccabee came along and he revolted against the Ptolemaic Empire and they were able to overthrow them. He cleansed the temple. That's where you get the practice of the Hanukkah that comes from or the festival of lights. And then they were ones who took over the place of priesthood, not on the basis of the descendancy that God had given in the Old Testament. But it came to be something that was a political kind of a thing. That it was something that was passed down in that way. Later on, when the Romans came in to rule, that same practice took place. They had made a high priest of Annas in about A.D. 6 to 15. And then they had removed him and installed Caiaphas in about A.D. 18. He went through about A.D. 36. It wasn't anything to do with a change because of what the law said and who should have been high priests. They were ones who were never in the lineage at all to be priests. But they were installed there by Rome because they were seen as political allies. This accounts for the lack of respect when Paul comes before the high priest. I knew not that you're the high priest or God's anointed as he put it. Obviously, he was bringing to them the fact that you're not the one who ought to be priests in the sight of Almighty God. You haven't followed the will of God. So now what happens? We're dealing with these people who have been giving, in, giving themselves unto this concept of we're in charge. But the law of Moses said nothing about those high priests. And it said nothing at all about those kind of priests that were called chief priests. The high priest should have been after the order that had been given through Aaron. And it was very clear with regard to the lineage. They didn't have that one. What they had was a council of priests that the Old Testament said absolutely nothing about with regard to ruling in the temple. And so what happens? What happens is they assumed that they had the power with regard to what was going on here, but they were wrong. They didn't have the power because God had never given them that power. They, number one, didn't have the right high priest. And number two, they had chief priests in a kind of a council organization that was never known to the Old Testament Scripture and the law of God. So what happens? They're saying, how can you come in here in the temple and overturn these tables and cast people out of here? Who gave you that kind of authority? 
Jesus was asking them a question about whether or not they recognized authority. They refused to tell him. But their very lives showed the fact. Their very existence showed the fact that they did not have any kind of a dear uh, feeling about the authority of God. They were not ones who kept that authority and practiced that. However, Jesus did. When you look at the things that Jesus was doing, that they were asking about, part of the thing that comes along in that chapter, in Matthew chapter 2, or Matthew chapter 21, in verses 1 through 11, I want you to notice what it says. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. When you look at this passage, it's pretty obvious that the chief priest and the so-called high priest didn't like what was going on here. What happened is, is they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. But this crowd recognized something that the Word of God tells us, that He indeed was the divine Messiah. In John chapter 20, that's the point that John gives with regard to His Gospel. Many other things Jesus did. There were other signs that were there, but these are written, why? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in Him, you have life in His name. That point of Him being the divine Messiah, that Christ, that Messiah of promise, who was deity come in the flesh, that's why they were giving him worship along this road. And that was something that was very clearly according to the will of God. In Zechariah chapter 9 and in verse 9, we read something prophetically about this Messiah. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And he goes on to talk about that and notes the fact that he was the one that ought to be received in that way. Why? He came upon the throne of David. He came as deity come to the world, and therefore he was to be worshipped. The fact that this fulfilled prophecy totally escaped the high priest and the chief priest. They didn't get it. But what was happening was every finger of the Old Testament was pointing at Jesus through the prophecies that this is the Messiah. Those people saw it. Those who were the priests did not. So Jesus had authority to do what he did. Why? As he was coming in and they were mad about that, that he was being received in this way, he was fulfilling exactly what God said would happen. And then it comes along in verses 12 through 17 that he cleanses the temple of the merchandisers that were there. We might point out something about this cleansing of the temple. The leaders believed that they had the authority over the temple and therefore they could do what they wanted to do. And what they decided to do with that is anytime you had come along with a sacrifice for uh, being given at the temple, what they would do is they would say, well, the law says it has to be blameless. And it didn't matter what sacrifice you brought, they would find that it was not blameless. It wasn't without spot or blemish. And they'd say, this one's not good enough. Now it just so happens that over here we can sell you a spotless sacrifice. 
maybe three or four times the money, but that's what you could do, you see. And if you were going to have a sacrifice, you were going to have to enrich their pockets to do it. Or if you had a coin to give into the treasury, they came up with the idea. Now, you can't have a coin that has the image of a man on it. You can search the scriptures through in the Old Testament, and you'll never find that verse because it doesn't exist. But they came up with that regulation. They said, all right, we'll take your money that's out there from the Romans with these heads on them, and we'll get you this other one over here. And guess what? The exchange ratio was probably somewhere in about five or six or seven to one of what they ought to have had to pay for. But that's what they were going to do if they were going to give that into the temple, you see. Well, in all of this, all they were doing was robbing the people. And as a result of that robbery, what Jesus pointed out is, you've actually conflicted with the law of God. And he even quotes from Isaiah chapter 56 that talks about this as a house of prayer and you've made it into a den of robbers. And over in Jeremiah, the seventh chapter, the point is made by Jeremiah, you trust in the temple. At that time, it was the temple that was built by Solomon, which was about to be destroyed by the Babylonians. And he says, you trust in this temple, and yet you practice the things that are contrary to what the God who's being worshipped in that temple has said. You ought to be giving yourself to worship you ought to be looking at God's law and living like that, but you disobey Him and you run to the temple and think you have safety. That's exactly the problem that was there with those in New Testament time. Those Jews were looking at the temple as being that which secured their right. The fact is that isn't what God said. God said they needed to be ones who were obedient. And without that obedience, they were not pleasing to Him. What happens in the next case is that you find Jesus in Matthew chapter 21 verses 18 and 19 going to a fig tree and causing it to be withered away. Now if anything pointed out his power and his authority, that did. The action itself was a miracle showing the fact that he was doing this of the heavenly power. He had divine might behind him. They did not recognize that, but everything showed who it was that Jesus was acting by. He was acting by the authority of God here, here, and here. And that's the answer that's given to them if they just looked at what was being done. If they looked at the Old Testament, they saw the fulfillment of prophecy in the first case. They saw the fact of it being cleansed as God had warned them over and over again in the Old Testament in the second case. And they could see with their own eyes that that happened in an immediate way. That was no power of a mere man. That was the power of God being worked by that being something that was withered away there. They had the answer for their question really before they asked it. And that's why Jesus said he would answer them if they answered he recognized what was there. But actually, Jesus had already shown them that authority very clearly. But I want to take you over to Mark chapter 11 and notice something. This is parallel to what we read in Matthew chapter 21. In Mark 11 and in verse 27 beginning, Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, the elders came to him, they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question. Then answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Now that's exactly what we had said back over there in Matthew chapter 21. But there's one phrase added here in Mark chapter 11. Then he says to them, what? Answer me. There's a command. Answer me the question. They refused to do it. They said, we don't know. But Jesus had demanded an answer from them. It was right for them to ask Jesus about by what authority is he doing these things. He had actually already answered it. But that was a right question to ask. But it's also something when he asked by what authority... 
Was there this baptism of John? Jesus knew, and so did they, that they hadn't been baptized with the baptism of John. They had failed to do that. And as a result of that, Jesus is asking them to give account for what they did. Why did you do it? Why were you not baptized with the baptism of John? If you go to Mark chapter 1, you recognize that the baptism of John was done because God sent John into the wilderness there preaching that baptism of repentance under remission of sin and the coming of the kingdom that it was near. In Luke chapter 3, the word of God came to John and he said, and he goes on to talk about the baptism. Yes, the Bible tells us very clearly where that baptism was from. It was from heaven. It was not from men. It was something that God had authorized, God had commanded, and therefore they were ones who needed to be obedient unto this. And they had not been obedient unto that baptism. So he's asking them, you answer me. There is a demand out here, you didn't do it, you answer me. Why did you not do that? Let me suggest something to you. When we look at things today, we have a similar situation. We look at a religious world round about us and the practices of the denominational world, and many of us ask, why do you do that? Where's the authority for what you're practicing? And I don't know whether you've seen this as much lately as I have, but sometimes when I ask, and that really the vast majority of the time that I ask a question to those in denominationalism, where do you find the authority for this denominationalism of various churches teaching various things, and they give me a look that I always call the fish look. You know what that is? They go, like, what in the world are you talking about? Like, that's a crazy question. I don't know what in the world. How do you even come up with that sort of a thing? Well, I get it from the Bible. Jesus asked them, answer me. Where did this come from? And we need to ask ourselves the practices that are out here in the denominational world. Where do they come from? To have somebody who says he's the vicar of Christ on earth. That somehow he has all authority on earth. Jesus has it in heaven. When Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus says that all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. That doesn't leave any room for that pope. And when we see a religious world that has all of these different titles, these different names, and what they say is, you know what? They all run to the same place. They all run to salvation. Where does it say that? I don't see anything about that. What I recognize in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4 is that there's one body. I know that one body, what it is, it's the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. When I look in the New Testament, I see Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and 18, I will build my church. My church. That's singular. So where did this multitude of churches come from? Where's the authority for that? The fact is that when we look at the Apostle Paul and writing to those at Corinth, they were divided. He didn't say, good job, you've done what I want you to do. He condemns them for their lack of unity. And he said that they ought to be of the same mind and in the same judgment, united in that, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. So when we look at those of denominationalism saying the exact opposite, where's the authority for that? While we're at it, where's the authority in the Pentecostal world for what has become a large practice? Now, it's Kenneth Copeland, if you don't recognize him. He started a movement that's called Holy Laughter. If you hadn't seen that sometime, go Google it. What happens is he goes out there and he just starts busting up laughing and everybody else in the whole congregation busts up laughing. That's called holy laughter. That's the Holy Spirit that took a hold of it. Now I want to know something. Where do you find in the New Testament the Holy Spirit's gift of laughter? I like to laugh. I laugh at jokes. I laugh at some things funny. But worship isn't a time for the holy bust up laughing. There isn't anything about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we see those gifts of the Spirit that are enumerated. Holy laughter isn't a one of them. I don't see anything about that in the Word of God. What am I taught by holy laughter? 
What is it that I learned? What instruction do I understand from God? How is God revered and sanctified and praised by holy laughter? There's nothing about that in the Word of God. And yet it's a practice that's more and more among those in Pentecostalism. You see entertainment in the worship services there. Entertainment of almost every kind. Maybe it is they have their praise teams that they have all in kind of a nice sort of a professional sounding way. And it's something that is there a part of their worship. Maybe they get in these guys called the power team. Bodybuilders. And they chop through ice blocks in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And that somehow is supposed to be worship to God. Or maybe it is that they have this light show go off, so light it'll blind you. But that's the kind of concept of what it takes to worship, is that sort of a thing. Or maybe we have a big chorus up here, and we get all together and have our band. Or maybe we get these guys that look like they slaughtered a bumblebee and put it on. This is Striper. This is the number one Christian rock group. And they're the ones who say they're giving praise to God in this. Or for us old fogies, there's James Taylor. He's out for a concert in some of these places. Where do you find the concert, all of these kind of things of entertainment, as being that which God authorized? Here's one where a guy says, well, I love this music at your church. Who's this Jesus guy they keep talking about? The girl says, I have no idea, but we've sung about him for years, and that's just about the way that it is. There is no concept of a reverence for God, of a worship of God, of looking to the Word of God for what God says, but it's just something that's put in the name of religion and given for whatever man wants to do. Folks, you can't find authority for that on any page of the Bible. When you look at the practices that are out there of the social gospel, having a bazaar all together, or maybe the family fun night where we got all of these things of ping pong trivia and everything else you notice worship isn't involved there oh we have an opening prayer by the way but then we get on to our fun or how about when you got a nice little church zumba class and we'll have that or how about when we have this place our facilities are available for your special occasions programs and gatherings look at that one a place for elegance here's what we are a place for elegance a place for gathering, a place for celebrations, a place for lasting memories, a place for special events. What's missing? Worship of God, praise of God, study of His Word. But that's what the majority of the religious world is like now. Now how about this when we have the church without walls recreation ministry? I was on a plane one time, and a young man sat down beside me, and I talked to him as we were about getting ready to go and asked him where he was from. He was going back to his home. I said, well, why are you up here? Well, I've been going to seminary. I said, is that right? And he said, yes. I went to a Baptist seminary. I said, well, I did my graduate work in a Baptist seminary, too. I said, did you major in Old Testament studies? No. <laughs> he looked at me. Kind of, oh, New Testament? No. I said, well, what did you do? He said, I majored in church recreation. That's what's there in the denomination of work. You can get a master's degree in that. But you can't find it one place in the Word of God. Not one verse gives us the idea that God has given that kind of mission to the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. It's not the goal for the basketball game or somehow the place out here that's the net for the soccer team. It is the pillar and ground of the truth, and that's the function that it is to have. Here are some people out here, the Westminster Recreation and Outreach Center. That's put on by the Westminster Presbyterian Church. Or you can have this idea of all kinds of other things that are out there in the name of the religious world. And yet when we ask them the question, what authority do you have for these things? We fail to get an answer except for something like this. Sometimes they'll give us an answer, well, it seems good to me. And if it seems good to me, that's good enough, isn't it? Well, no, because there's a problem with that, you see. In Proverbs chapter 14 and in verse 12, 
There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, if we didn't get that the first time, when the Word of God says something, it's important and we need to listen to it. But you know, you can turn two chapters over in chapter 16 and verse 25, the same exact words are said. Does that tell us anything? God's emphasizing something through that repetition. And it is that I may think something's right, and it in fact is that which is deadly in the sight of God because it goes away from Him. If I don't believe that's true, ask Nadab and Abihu. They recognized that they died because of that. I need to look for what is right in the sight of God. It may be they come along and say, Lord, I'm doing this to praise you. That's why we're doing this. Well, in Luke chapter 6 and in verse 40, this is what Jesus says. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? When people are manifesting this kind of attitude by their voice, I'm praising you. If I'm not doing what the Lord said, I can't be praising Him. Because Jesus pointed out, you need to do the things I say if you're going to claim that. Or when someone says, now, we don't really need Bible authority for everything we practice, do we? Some of our institutional friends tell us that. That there are things, a lot of things we do that we have no authority for. Well, I want you to turn with me. The song that we sung before the lesson was large, largely based on this verse. In Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 17. And, now get this. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. What does it mean to do something in the name of another? If a policeman knocks on your door and says, I want you to open up in the name of the law, he isn't asking you to open the door like some smart aleck and say, uh, Pasadena Police Department. He's saying, I've got the authority to tell you to open up your door. He has a search warrant or whatever. He has a right to do that. Now, what is the Apostle Paul telling us through inspiration? Whatever you do, whether it's in word or in deed, whether it's in your teaching or in your practice, you do all in the name or by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. That leaves out nothing. We can't come along and say, well, this is a small thing. I don't think there's any problem with this. Or we don't have to have authority for everything. Yes, we do. That's exactly what Jesus told us we need to do. And therefore, what we need to do is give ourselves to an understanding of the truth. The gospel identifies that which is the approved practice that comes from God. When you look in John chapter 14 and verse 15, Jesus points out the fact that if you love me, you keep my commandments. That same thing is pointed out a chapter later in chapter 15 and in verse 10. If I claim to love Jesus and I fail to keep His commandments or somehow justify the breaking of those, I don't love Jesus. Over in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3, hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Over in 1 John chapter 5 verses 2 and 3, that same thing being pointed out. That if we're going to know Him and love Him, we obey that which is His will. Is it important to Jesus? He said it was. The apostles inspired by Jesus said it was. That we need to keep His commandments. He also points out there in 1 John in chapter 5 that His commandments are not burdensome. They're not grievous. They're not hard. Therefore, our benefit always. We get to thinking about the idea that the Word of God is just some cumbersome burden that we don't want to keep. That's the old devil talking. That isn't the God of heaven talking. The God of heaven pointed out we need to do what He says. Even as we pointed out on Sunday, it's for our good always. Not only Old Testament, but new as well. In Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 21, Beginning, Matthew chapter 7. Start with me there in verse 21. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount coming toward the end says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, 
shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That lawlessness, that which was not according to the law, they could not turn to the word of God and show why they were doing it. And yet their claim is, Lord, Lord, we've done this. What Jesus points out is, what's doing what's right before God is doing what he says within his will. We need to be obedient. Not just in our profession. We need to be obedient in all that we do and all that we say. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16, the Apostle Paul speaks to the young Timothy. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. If you want to know what it is that we ought to be doing, then get in the Scripture. Get one's eyes in the Scripture, think in the Scripture, look at the Scripture, tell it, let it tell us what we need to do. And then what are we? We're given everything completely of all that God calls a good work. When man comes along and they say, well, I think this is a good work. What I think and what you think are not what counts. What counts is what does God call a good work? And what 2 Timothy chapter 3 says is that completely guides us to every good work that God has in mind for us. What happens when we go beyond that? In 2 John 9, Whosoever goeth onward and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. God has given us through Jesus Christ His gospel. That's the doctrine of Christ. It came from Him. It has the origin of being from Christ. When we stay within the boundaries of that doctrine that He has declared, what happens? We are the Father and the Son. What happens when we go outside of that? Add to it. Do something other than what God has said. We have not God. That's the simple message that John spoke by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And we need to be those who pay very close attention to that. We need to ask ourselves, is my religious practice from heaven or from men? That's what we ask ourselves. I know the elders here, I know Jerry, I know others who are here. You want to practice what is right in the sight of God in book, chapter, and verse. Folks, if it's a right practice, you can go to the Word of God and you can lay your finger on the passage that would authorize it. When we do that, we do things that are right by God. They are authorized of God. And if someone asks us, Where's the authority for these things that you do? Right here. That's where it is. Isn't that simple? When we start going out and we start seeing what's there in the religious world round about us and we ask that same question, where is the authority for what's being done? Now, if somebody's really going to look at that, they'll start to see in a real hurry that there are many practices out there that there's no verse that you can put with that. And you know what? That is something that is a very important question. If my religious practice is from heaven, I can find it in the Bible. It's from men, I can't. And you know what? In Matthew chapter 7, that verse 21, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, what day is he talking about? talking about the day of judgment. You and I will stand before the judgment bar of Christ at the end of time. Indeed, John 12 points out the fact that the Father has given all judgment to Jesus. It was His Word that He gave. He gave it to the apostles through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And now, we stand before the judgment bar of Christ at the end of all time, and we have to answer, by what authority did you do these things? That's an important question to Jesus. When he was talking to the chief priests and the scribes, he says, answer me. 
And my friend, you and I cannot do what they did. We cannot say, I don't know. Because our eternity depends on the answer to that question. Are you here this evening having never named the name of Jesus Christ as you ought, as according to his word? We have many who come along and say, oh, I've been saved. I know because I believed in my heart that Jesus was my personal Savior, and right there and then I was saved. But that's not how Jesus said it. Somebody says, well, I know I'm saved. I said the sinner's prayer, and I felt that feeling in my heart. Number one, you can look all through the Word of God, and you'll never find the sinner's prayer. There's no authority from heaven about that. There's no statement of that anywhere in the Scripture. And the fact of it is, I can have a feeling that I'm right and be wrong. You remember what Proverbs chapter 14 and chapter 16 said? So my feeling isn't dependable. But if I listen to Jesus, he said, you go into all the world and you preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you've been a believer that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you've been baptized into his name for remission of sins, just as Acts 2.38 points, you can go to verses and you can point why you did those things. But you know what verse you can go to to point to faith only? Only one. It's in James 2. We see that a man is saved by works and not by faith only. That's what the scripture has to say about faith only. That's what we can find if we look and we search for that in the scripture. Now, which is more important? What I think or what my preacher told me or what mom and dad said or what the word of God says that we can find in Jesus' own word. If you come to Christ, you've been obedient unto him. You've been baptized, raised to walk in newness of life. Paul talked about it. But instead of continuing in that new life, you went back into the old life. What do you need to do? Well, in Acts chapter 8, one like that, Simon the sorcerer, he had done that which was right initially in being baptized, being, uh, believing in being baptized, just as Jesus had commanded. But then he went into sin. Peter told him, you're in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity. Pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. A Christian who's straight can go to that verse and he can point. Here's someone that changed his heart, that changed his soul, or repented. And they were prayerful about that. They prayed God for forgiveness and they could be forgiven. How do I know? By what authority? By Scripture. You can find it in the Word of God. You're here this evening and you haven't been doing that which is according to the will of God and you need to start. We hope you will. And if we can help you in your obedience to God, we hope you'll come while we stand and while we sing.